Well, hi. I am here today to talk to you about how to take a good idea and turn it into a great song. Now, all of us have good ideas. We wouldn't be songwriters if we didn't. You know, you're driving down the road and, oh, that could be a song. Or you're in the shower. Shower is a great place. In fact, the car and the shower are what I call the two homes of the muse. The muse is the part of us that comes up with a great idea for the song. But you can also get it from just thinking about your own life or listening to other people, hanging out with other people. Oh, that suggests a song idea. There's a, a joke, for those of you that have been in Nashville and know what the writing climate is like there, there's a joke that a woman walks into a bar in Nashville and says to the bartender, pour me a double of your strongest whiskey. And he says, yes, ma'am, he pours it. He goes, what seems to be the problem? She goes, I guess I'm just a one-man woman in a two-bit town, and everyone in the bar goes. Right? You pull the ideas from wherever you pull them. The question is, once you've been inspired, once your muse says to you, oh, that would be a great idea for a song, how do you convert it and edit it into a song that's going to impact hundreds, thousands, even possibly millions of people? That's what we're going to talk today about, how to convert a good idea into a great song that impacts many, many people. Now, I've been teaching songwriting for close to 40 years now. I've had a lot of success. A lot of my students have had record deals, publishing deals, uh, over a thousand songs in film and television, if you add them all up. A couple even have had charted hits. And one of the things I noticed was that, that there was something in terms of their lyric writing that they were in their early developmental stages of writers they weren't doing. Now, at the beginning, my teaching focused mostly on music writing, although I wrote both music and lyrics myself. I focused on music writing because there weren't a lot of people teaching that. And I became known as the melody guy. You know, you want to you study melody, Jai's the guy to study with. And I took a lot of my students through courses in melody writing, chord progressions, grooves, all the aspects of music writing. But I began to notice after a while that there was an area in terms of lyric writing that they just didn't get that was so obvious to me. Now, in addition to teaching, I also had a career as a songwriter. I had a lot of songs recorded by various people. Uh, you're going to hear one of them later on in this workshop. But I've also co-written with nine different writers that have had number one hits. And every single time I sat down to write with them, there was a certain process that we followed. It wasn't like black and white. It wasn't, well, let's do step A and step B. It was just naturally what we did. And whether I was writing pop, whether I was writing R&B, whether I was writing country, it was the same process for writing substantial songs that had stories to them. And I said, well, look, a lot of my students were missing that. And I said, well, you know, I'm a songwriting teacher. I'm just going to create a system that codifies what I've already been doing with all the hit writers I've been writing with. And so that's a system that I came up with called the Songwriter's Blueprint, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, by the way, I've sort of semi-retired from teaching. I'm not doing one-on-one -on -one lessons with folks anymore, but I am doing something called Song Shop, and I am doing individual consultations, and we'll talk about that at the end of this workshop. But what I want to tell you is this system called the Songwriter's Blueprint that has helped so many writers that I've been working with with have more success. So let's get down to the fundamentals. What is the purpose of a song? Why would you write a song? Well, the real purpose of writing a song is not to make yourself feel good. It's to impact the listener and to make the listener feel a certain way. It's not about you. Your songs are not about you. They start with an inspiration from you. They start with a good idea from your life or the life of someone you may observe. But they're not about making you happy. 
If you're a professional, your job is to make the listener feel what you felt. It's like, I'll give you a great example. So I've been living up here in the Bay Area for close to 15 years now, and I happen to be a major basketball fan. And we happen to have an amazing team up here called the Golden State Warriors, who won the championship last year. And you know what? I am so passionate about the Warriors. I go to Warriors games. I've got friends that I talk about the Warriors with on a weekly basis. I write on Warriors blogs from time to time. I've got so many great ideas about the Warriors that I'm passionate about. So you know what I think I'm going to do? I think instead of talking about songwriting, I'm just going to spend the rest of this workshop talking about the Warriors because it makes me happy. It excites me. You guys have a problem with that? You do? Why? Oh, because that's not what you're here for. You're not here to listen to what I'm passionate about. You're here for me to touch you in a way that impacts you. And in this particular case, I'm here as a songwriting teacher and coach. So you want me to help you write better songs. And because I'm a professional, that's what I'm going to do. So you have to think as a professional songwriter, it's not your job to make yourself feel good with a song. It's your job to make the listener feel something, whether it's sadness, whether it's happiness, whether it's any one of a range of emotions. That's your job as a songwriter to impact the listener. Uh, Olivia Rodrigo, who we're actually going to take apart one of her songs in just a few minutes. She says the thing that thrills her the most is when someone comes up to her at a concert and goes, oh, my God, how did you know? That's exactly what happened to me. That really touched me because it touches my own experience. And that's what you want to do. You want to create a song that touches the listener's experience. So the question is, how do you do that lyrically? And that's what the songwriter's blueprint, which I'm going to show you today, is going to help and enable you to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to take apart a major hit, top three hit, by Olivia Rodrigo, as a matter of fact, and look at how the blueprint would have helped create that song exactly. Then we're going to take a look at a song written by one of my students, and we're going to talk about the before version, how he wrote it when it first came out of his inspiration, and then how the blueprint helped mold it into a song that would impact others like you. And you'll hear the difference. And then at the very end, I'm going to take a song that I wrote with one of the number one hit writers that I've written with that actually just got a cut about a year and a half ago. And we're going to examine how that writer and I sat down and wrote it using what is essentially the blueprint system. Okay, so before we get into that, I want to talk to you about there's a certain category of songs where the lyrics just basically aren't that important. They're basically groove songs, music based songs, where the lyrics just have to sound good. They don't really tell a story and they don't really tell your story. And if you're writing that kind of a song, first of all, that kind of a song is very difficult to get placed if you're not already established in the industry. But if you're writing that kind of a song, you don't have to worry so much about blueprinting the lyrics. I'll give you a great example. There's a song that was on the charts about a half a dozen years ago. It actually won the Grammy for Record of the Year, although it didn't win the Grammy for Song of the Year. Those are two different things. Record of the Year, which meant great record, but it didn't win Song of the Year. Ed Sheeran won the Song of the Year because his songs are songs that people relate to and impact people. Sometimes his songs are sung at weddings or things like that for a long time. The particular one that won the Grammy for Song of the Year that year is one that is sung a lot at weddings because everybody can relate to it. But this was a great record, not necessarily a great song. And the lyrics, basically, in a song like this, they just serve basically as ear candy. You want to, like, put them out, and they're all about, you know, well, let me, let me read you. The song is called Uptown Funk. Let me read you the lyrics. Okay. 
This hit, that ice cold, Michelle Pfeiffer, that white gold, this one for them hood girls, good girls, masterpieces, styling wild and living it up in the city. I got Chucks on with St. Laurent. I gotta kiss myself, I'm so pretty. I'm so hot, hot damn. Call the police and the fireman. Girls hit your hallelujah, cause Uptown Funk gonna give it to you. Uptown Funk gonna give it to you. It's an interesting lyric. There's some great rhymes. There's a rhyme later in that song that goes, Drive to Harlem, Hollywood, Jackson, Mississippi. When we show up, we're gonna show out smoother than a fresh jar of Skippy. I mean, they're clever lyrics, but they're not telling a story that you as a listener are gonna empathize with. Do you have Chucks on in St. Laurent and kiss yourself because you're so pretty? You know, they're basically songs that have cool lyrics about how cool the singer is. And they're great. A lot of Lizzo stuff is like that. If you listen to About Damn Time or Juice, there's no story in there that most people can relate to, but they're great lyrics. And they certainly make the writer who is always the singer sound great and sound cool. And I can't help you write a song like that because I wouldn't know how to, you know, it's basically a music track and cool hip sounding lines, but that's not the kind of song we're talking about today. We're talking today about most of the songs on the pop charts, other than hip hop, most of the songs on the adult contemporary charts, most of the songs on the country charts, even uh, old school R&B songs like Leave the Door Open. You know, they all follow this blueprint. And so that's what we're gonna to talk today is how to write a song that can possibly touch and impact people so they will say what people say to Olivia Rodrigo. How did you know? That's exactly what happened to me. That's what I feel like. That's what we're gonna talk about. So first question is, why do I call it a blueprint? Well, a blueprint is a metaphor from architecture. If you go up to an architect and say, I just bought this beautiful piece of land. It's got a beautiful view of the mountains. I want you to build me a house with a big picture window in the master bedroom that overlooks that mountain. So when I wake up in the morning, I'll see those mountains. Does the architect then summon in some construction workers and start building that bedroom? Of course not, because it has to be a part of a house. They have to have, there's a whole, whole architectural process called programming, schematic design, construction documents, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole architectural process that an architect goes through. They don't just start building it right away. If they just started building the master bedroom, there might wind up being no door to the bathroom or, you know, no door to the front of a house or the living room right on top of the bathroom or anything could happen, you know? So what they do is they create a blueprint for where the house is gonna be so they can structure it. So that inspiration, that beautiful master bedroom with a view of the mountains comes into being. And so that's what I'm talking about doing with your songs, creating a blueprint for how the song is going to go so that you can have an impact on the listener. Is that making sense? All right, so what's the first step of the songwriter's blueprint? The first step is coming up with what I call a relatable premise. So those are two big words. Premise means what the song is built on. Relatable is something that everybody or most people can relate to. And then you wanna have a title that reflects your relatable premise. So we're gonna take a look at the uh, Olivia Rodrigo song, Deja Vu. And Olivia Rodrigo herself said, this is a quote from her. She said, I thought it would be a cool play on words to use Deja Vu as a metaphor for this very universal thing that happens when you break up with someone, they get with someone else and you see the two of them living the life that you lived, okay? There's the premise and a title that encapsulates it. And so that's she and her co-writer, Daniel Nigro, started out with that premise and that title. Then the next step you do in the songwriter's blueprint is you fill out the chorus. Now, in this case, the chorus is very simple. It's just, do you get deja vu? Do you get deja vu when she's with you? 
many songs take a while. They might not have the hook or the title till the end of the chorus. And they might have a bunch of lines in the chorus that go there. The song of mine that I'm going to be sharing with you is in that category or any combination in between. But after you've laid out the relatable premise and the title, then you figure out where is the title gonna fit in the chorus and what's gonna fill out the rest of the chorus. That's the first step of the songwriter's blueprint. Okay? All right, then the second step would be, what are you gonna do in the first verse? Now I'm assuming here we're going to be talking only about verse chorus songs. The songwriter's blueprint actually applies to way more than verse chorus songs. I've got students that do hip hop. I've got one student that does musical theater. None of them work directly with simple verse chorus forms all the time, but the blueprint still works. But since 95, 98% of the songs that you're going to be writing are going to be verse chorus songs, I'm talking in terms of a verse chorus song. So, Again, the relatable premise and the title in the chorus that reflects the relatable premise. Now you come to your first verse. And the first verse has two jobs. The main job of the verse is to set up the chorus, to make the relatable premise and the title inevitable by what the first verse does so that when the chorus comes, it pays it off. The second job of the first verse is to capture the listener's attention on the first line. If you don't hook somebody with the first line of your song, and by the way, what is the purpose of a first line of a song? It's very simple. It's just to make you want to hear the second line and to make you want to continue to work your way through the song. So one good way to do that is with imagery. And imagery, there's of three types. There's visual imagery, which is the most common, but there's also auditory imagery, and there's also tactile imagery. But you engage the listener's senses somehow with pictures or sounds or descriptions of feelings, not just a statement of fact. You want to start your song, if at all possible, that way to intrigue the listener and get their interest. And then you want to build the first verse toward the chorus where the relatable premise is spoken in terms of the title and it pays off. First verse, set up, chorus, pay off. Okay, so let's look at uh, deja vu. She opened it with these phrases, car rides to Malibu, strawberry ice cream, one spoon for two, and trading jackets, laughing about how small it looks on you. So right away, you know that there's, those are, it's obviously a couple out on a date doing all that stuff together. And you get the car ride to Malibu is beautiful visual image, strawberry ice cream. You can kind of taste it. That engages your, your, taste sense, you know, trading jackets, laughing about how small it looks on you. You can see this scene. You don't know who these people are yet. She'll be building that. That's how she structured the first verse. But she starts out with images that get you involved into the scene. Then she says, watching reruns of Glee, being annoying, singing in harmony. And then she turns on the next phrase, which tells you who those two people are. She goes, I bet she's bragging to all her friends, saying that you're so unique. So, ah, you get it. It's about a woman who's dating a guy that the singer dated previously. And then comes the pre-chorus, which totally sets up the chorus, goes, so when you're going to tell her that we did that too, she thinks it's special, but it's all reused. I made the jokes you tell to her when she's with you. See, so you know who the characters are, you're all set up, and then the chorus pays it off. Do you get deja vu? Do you get deja vu when she's with you? Do you get deja vu when she's with you? It's like, oh, you're doing the same thing with her. But it doesn't say that you do the same thing with her that you did with me. It gives you some wonderful images. It lets you know who the characters are on that line where it turns, when you say, I bet she's bragging, telling her friends you're so unique, but we did that too. It's a perfect setup for the payoff chorus. Do you get deja vu when she's with you? Okay, now let's look at the second verse. The second verse has two jobs. One, it has to also set up the chorus, has to pay off on the chorus, and 
it also has to say something different than the first verse. John Bettis, amazing lyric writer, if you know your songwriting history, you'll know he's the only writer to have number one hits with the three biggest stars of the 80s, Madonna, Michael Jackson, and Whitney Houston. Number one hits with all three of them. And he gave a talk once that I was at, and he said, you know, if you've done your job as a songwriter, your first verse has totally set up your chorus. Your chorus has totally paid off your first verse. And now what do you say? It's very tricky. You have to go to a different place in the second verse. So where has Olivia Rodrigo not gone in that first verse? Well, she hasn't said much about that other girl. She's just someone that's in a scene with her ex-boyfriend. So she starts the second verse. Do you call her and almost say my name? Because let's be honest, we kind of sound the same. Another actress, I hate to think that I was just your type. Wow, what a cool line. I mean, how many people have felt or said that it's like when your ex gets together with somebody else who's so much like you in so many ways, God, was I just your type? Did you really care about me or was I just your type? Because this woman is obviously your type as well. So it's taking it to a different level. Then she goes to some auditory images. I bet she knows Billy Joel because you played her Uptown Girl. I bet you even tell her that you love her even between in between the chorus and the verse. So that's just such a great image. You can hear the song and you can hear the person. That's an auditory image, you see? And then that sets up, well, when are you gonna tell her that we did that too? She thinks it's special, but it's all reused. I played you the song she's singing now when she's with you. Which sets up, do you get deja vu? Do you get deja vu? So the first verse sets up the chorus, the second verse sets up the chorus, and the chorus gives you the payoff which relays the relatable premise. Now, the next question we all face is, what do you do after two verses and two choruses? Now, there's so many different possibilities. You can write a standard bridge. You can just have an instrumental hit the chorus again. You can repeat part of the first verse. You can write a third verse. What Olivia Rodrigo and Daniel Nigro decided to do was to do kind of a mashup. They have this great synthesizer and drum combo that enters like in the second verse, which is a great drum track and a synth lick. And they put that in there and then they just kind of throw the words of the previous parts of the song on top of them in almost a helter-skelter fashion. Very similar to what Taylor Swift did in Cruel Summer. So, and then finally she ends it with, I know you get deja vu. You see, that's how that song got built. If you haven't heard that song yet, by the way, I advise you to go listen to it because you'll hear how all these things work to set it up in that fashion. And that's what the blueprint allows you to do. Now, did Olivia and Dan sit down and blueprint the song? No, not necessarily, but they definitely said, okay, she said, this is the premise, this is the title, and in the first verse we'll set it up this way, in the second verse let's set it up that way. And that's what we're talking about. You know, that will enable you to write something that everybody can empathize with and say, as they say to her, how did you know? I felt like that too. Okay? Cool. Now we're gonna take a look at how the blueprint can take a song and make it better. So I'm going to play a song for you written by one of my students. And this was the way his inspiration gave him the song. This was his first draft. This was the way it felt to him. Now, you're going to like the song only because he's a really great melody writer and a good singer and it's got a vibe. But if you think about it, do you really emotionally feel anything? Because the lyrics don't really set up a story. They're just kind of random helter-skelter lyrics around a theme. Uh, the song is called Letting Go, or at least the first version was called Letting Go. I want to play you a verse in a chorus and then we'll talk about it. The 
sun rose like a gunshot. Excuse me. Here's the beginning. You were the full moon. You lit up the sky, but everything was black and white. The sun rose like a gunshot ricocheting down a canyon. I knew I couldn't live in the dark anymore, but I would still miss the starry night. I can see my path leads, but I'm trusting myself right now. I have to run. All I need is you to love my sunrise I'll let it go Of you, my love It's, it's beautiful because the images are nice and the melody is just, and the chords, the way they work together are just gorgeous. But the question is, what's happening in this song? Why did the sun rise like a gunshot ricocheting down a canyon? And why does he have to run? And why is he letting go of his partner? It's not really clear. And I think if you be honest with yourself, and you can subtract the beauty of the music. Does the lyric really impact you? Is that a song you would buy or play frequently on Spotify? Is that something you'd want to hear again and again? Does it make you say, oh yeah, I know how, if, how you feel. That's exactly what happened to me. Now, so I sat with him and worked with him and coached him. By the way, his name is Bryce Dalmeyer really good songwriter, you'll be hearing from him. So he sat down and worked together and said, well, what happened? What's the story? He said, well, I had this partner who was unreliable, couldn't trust. They cheated on me sometimes. And as much as we had great times together, I just couldn't be with them anymore. And I had to let go. He said, ah, that's a universe. That, how many people has that happened to? You know, I bet either it's happened to you or you know somebody that's happened to. So that's the essence of what he's trying to say, but it doesn't come across in the lyric of the first version of the song. So we put together a blueprint and said, okay, what's the premise? Okay, here's the premise. I love you, but I don't trust you not to cheat on me. So I have to move on because you don't even seem remorseful about what you've done. That's a premise, a good premise. And then the title was, I don't want to go, but, and then you'll hear the rest of the but. That's the title that appeared in the chorus. So that was the premise in the title. Now we have to structure verses that set that up. Okay, the person's partner, lover, isn't even in the first song. There's gunshots ricocheting down canyons, but it doesn't say anything. So it's gonna start with the person sitting in front of their partner. The opening line is, I'm searching your face for a hint of regret, but there is no sign of it. Wow, that's a great compelling first line. Then I'm cupping my hands around our flame because our candle is barely lit. Ooh, what a good way to say, you know, it's going. You know, I'm trying to hold back the rush of your words from blowing out my light because you were reckless. Now I'm, breath now, now I'm breathless, caught in your lie. Oh, and then he says, I wanted to go back to how it was but now I know how you really think of us. And the chorus is, I don't want to go, but you aren't even fighting. I don't want to go, but I'm the only one crying. Ah, there's a story that you can relate to. 
you can see them sitting there and you can see that moment when he decides, you know, I can't, can't stay because of this. Then the second verse, he talks about, you know, you're always good with your words and your apologies, but they don't really mean much. And I can't really count on you and I can't really depend on you. You're not really there for me and I'm gonna to have to go. And I notice you're not even fighting it. And I'm the only one crying here, definitely. So take a listen to how this song, now this revised song, it's the same melody, by the way, same chord, same track actually, but see how these words draw you in more emotionally. I'm searching your face for a hint of regret, but there is no sign of it. I'm cupping my hands around our flame, cause our candles barely lit. I'm trying to hold back the rush of your words from blowing out my light. Cause you were reckless, now I'm breathless, caught in your life. I wanted to go back to how it was, but now I know how you really think of us. takes it somewhere else in the second verse. Always good with your words, but this time I learn they don't mean that much. I can't hear what you're saying over this pain. I can't even feel your touch. I wish this was the first time you let me down, but I'm starting to lose count. You've always been reckless How did I let this bury me in the ground? There are so many good memories But I can't live off of only apologies See, see how much more that song makes you feel, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. I've been there, I'm there with you, you know? So the melody was the same essentially. And the concept he had in his mind was the same, but the manifestation was different because the blueprint set it up in a very particular way to make you the listener empathize with what's going on in the song. And that's what the blueprint does. That's one of the things I do in Song Shop too. I help people get blueprint their songs. That just happened the other day. I was teaching Song Shop literally two days ago and two different people had songs that nobody else knew what was going on. And when we blueprinted them and redid the lyrics, everybody went, oh yeah, yeah. So that's something that you wanna do for yourself is blueprint your songs. Now I'll talk about you don't need to 
necessarily sit down and write a cut and dry blueprint and say, oh, this is how I'm writing this song. I'm starting with a relatable premise. That's not how you use the blueprint. I'll explain to you in detail at the end, after we've listened to the third song, about really how can you apply this to your songwriting and still keep your inspiration strong, because that's what you want to do. The blueprint does not replace inspiration. It just frames inspiration in such a way that the listener can feel that same inspiration. So I want to tell you the story of one of my own songs now. Uh, I wrote this song in Nashville with one of my favorite co-writers. Her name is Joey Scott. She's one of the nine writers I've worked with that had number one hits. She had actually two number one hits, one with Colin Ray and one with Shania Twain. And I, when I lived in LA and was actively songwriting, I used to go to Nashville, oh, maybe two or three times a year and write with different writers. And on this particular trip, I had a writing session scheduled with Joey. And I went over to her house and sat down and said, hey, what's going on? And what do you want to write today? She said, you know, I've had this line in my head. I don't know what to do with it, but it's just a line that really, really moves me. And I think we could do something with it. I said, what is it? She goes, there's tears rolling down the face of the earth tonight. I went, wow, what a great image. And all of a sudden, I said, I hear the music for that line. I hear it. Listen, let's listen, listen. There's tears rolling down the face of the earth tonight. Yeah. Okay, good. We like that. Let's, let's move on. So what do we do? What do you think we did? We basically, without using the word blueprint, we created a blueprint. So okay, okay, so first of all, where is that song, where is that line going? There's tears rolling down the face of the earth tonight. Well, we didn't think it was appropriate. It could have been done as a personal love song, but we didn't think that it should be done as a personal love song. We thought, no, you know, this is, this is a song about problems of the world problems that the world is having. And we should make this a song about, you know, about the world. So oh, since they're rolling down the face of the earth, so that's fine. So wh what are we gonna talk about? Well, Joey and I, we started talking. That's how ideas come. You talk back and forth. And we realized, you know, and again, don't want to offend anyone's religious beliefs here. You're not supposed to talk about politics or religion in these workshops. But there was this whole concept of God going around where God is gonna come down and save us all. And we don't have to worry about taking care of the planet. We don't have to worry about anything because God will come down. There will be an apocalypse and God will save everybody. Well, that's cool. Joey and I didn't happen to believe that. Joey and I both believe in God actually quite strongly. We're both very spiritual folks, but we said, you know, God empowers us. God gave us the power to solve the problems of the earth. And then, oh yeah, there's, there's a, a little story actually that came to me that I shared with Joey that she laughed and she said, that's what I'm talking about. If I digress for a minute, so a little story, uh, there's a priest in his church and the village is starting to flood and the villagers come by in a car and say, better jump in this car because the church is gonna be submerged. He says, no, I'm gonna stay with God and stay with the church. So the flood has progressed now and he's up on the second floor and you can't even drive down the street. You have to take a boat and they send a boat by and they say, father, you better jump in the boat. You know, he says, no, I'm going to stay here with the church. Well, finally, the waters have all but enveloped the church and he's on the roof and they send a helicopter and it's got a, a rope ladder. They jump on the rope ladder. He says, no, I'm going to stay with the church. God will save me. Well, he drowns. And he goes to heaven and appears before God. And he says, God, I stayed with the church. Why didn't you save me? And God says, well, I sent you a car and a boat and a helicopter. That's kind of the idea of this song. It's like, you know, God isn't some magic force that will clean things up. God empowered us with the power to save ourselves and to save the earth from anything negative that's going on. So, we went through that for a while and we said, what's a good title? And we came up with Our Hands. God put it in Our Hands. And so the opening line of the verse 
excuse me, the opening line of the chorus was there's tears rolling down the face of the earth tonight. And then we built the chorus, which you'll hear in a moment. We went all the way through to the end, which is he put it in our hands. Okay, we got the premise. And the premise is basically there are many problems on the planet, but God doesn't solve them by magic. He solves them by empowering us to solve them for ourselves. Great. I thought it was great. So did the, the band that cut it. And by the way, just as a, as a digression, uh, one of the happiest moments of my time in Nashville was when Reba McIntyre actually personally called my song plugger and said, I want to record that song on our hands. It's so beautiful. Unfortunately, she ultimately didn't record it. But just the fact that she loved it and wanted to record it made me feel really good. And then, of course, it did get a cut with this band that had a top 40 record. So obviously we did something right. So we sat down and said, OK, how are we going to set this up verse wise? Well, we started out with a verse, a first verse that told two stories. One, the story of a young boy that was killed by a drunk driver. The second, a woman somewhere in the Middle East that got blown up by a terrorist bomb, because those are things that would cause tears to roll down the face of the earth. And it paid off on the chorus. Now, in the second verse, we took it to the step further that we wanted to say, which is, you know, I can't fix the fact that this guy was killed by a drunk driver, but here's what I can do. I can, I can raise my kids better. I can teach them things so that that won't happen to them. They won't be the drunk driver or the victim. And I may not be able to fix everything in the Middle East, but there are things that I can do for the people around me to spread love. And that also took it to another level and paid off on the chorus coming from a different place. And then we had a very short little bridge that was, you know, he put it in our hands and then we added your hands, my hands, and any time we did something about it and started doing this. So that's the way the song was written. That was the blueprint, as it were, that we laid out that helped us create this song. I'm gonna play for you now the demo I can't play the recording by the band because there's copyright restrictions. But since we got to keep the publishing, which was another miracle, uh, which might not have happened if Reba had recorded it, don't know. But uh, we got to keep the publishing, so the rights are ours. So this is just our demo. This is the demo that we created that got us that cut and that interest from Reba. So I'm going to play it for you now, and you'll hear the blueprint in action. He was only a kid driving daddy's truck Someone up the road had been drinking too much Went out of control And one more soul was heaven bound She was making her way through the marketplace Walking in the sand with a veil on her face when a bomb went off and life was lost again There's tears rolling down the face of the earth tonight From here across the oceans and the desert you can feel her cry We've been praying and waiting for God to save her But didn't we listen When he said love that neighbor You see he's already got a plan To give this whole world a chance He put it in our hands Our hands Now I can't fix what that drunk driver did But I can spend a little more time at home with my kids Teach them common sense There's a consequence for everything we do And 
But I can't change what's happening in the Middle East But if I see somebody hurting I can roll up my sleeves Try to ease their pain Make them smile again somehow There's tears rolling down the face of the earth tonight From here across the oceans and the desert You can feel the cry We've been praying and waiting for God to save her But didn't we listen when he said, love that neighbor? You see, he's already got a plan To give this whole world a chance He put it in our hands Your hands, my hands And any time we took a stand See where that song came from? I think it came out wonderful. I'm very, very proud of that song. And it came out by Joey just suggesting one line, are building that into a relatable premise, setting up verses that paid off on the chorus from the relatable premise, and adding a little bridge that added just a little touch. And that's the thing about the songwriter's blueprint. It does not replace inspiration. If you say, oh, I'm going to go home now and I'm going to blueprint a song and I'm going to make the relatable premise this, it's not necessarily going to work well. You've got to start with inspiration. As a matter of fact, what I strongly recommend is that you don't even think about the songwriter's blueprint while you're in the throes of inspiration. You know, there are two characters each of us songwriters carries. I call them the muse and the editor. And when the muse is flowing through you, let it flow through you. Let everything come out. Don't worry if it makes sense. Don't worry if it rhymes. Don't worry if it's verses or choruses. Don't worry. Just get all that juicy, delicious, inspirational material. I was very blessed one time to have a song that I literally wrote. I woke up in the morning at 6.30 with an inspiration. By 7.15, I had finished the song, and it was recorded exactly in that form. On the other hand, I've had songs recorded that took three years and four rewrites. You know, it can come anyway. But you start with the inspiration. That's what you start with. And then you say, okay, thank you, Muse. Now I'm going to bring in my editor. And that's when you start setting up a blueprint. You go, okay, what's the relatable premise of this song? And then what's the title that reflects the relatable premise? And then how am I going to set that up in the first verse? And how am I going to set that up with the second verse? And how is it going to be a bridge? And you actually get that all mapped out. And then you take all the pieces from your inspiration and see where they fit in. You know, it may be that the fourth thing you thought of is the first line of the song. Or the first thing you thought of is the last line of the chorus. You can put them in any, in any order. You know, once you've got that raw material, the blueprint is simply a way of structuring and organizing your inspiration so that it comes out in the form of a song that people can relate to and people will say, oh, yes, I so feel what you're talking about. You know? uh, what, give you one more interesting thing in terms of blueprinting a song. I was one of the co-writers that I got to work with when I was in LA was a wonderful writer who was also one of the nine number one hit writers I worked with. Her name was Gloria Sklarov, great writer. And we were working on a song we had the premise, we had the title, we had the chorus, and we were stuck on the first verse. We knew what we wanted to say, but we couldn't get the words to come in the right order. And Gloria made this great suggestion, which is, well, instead of trying to write the verse from the top down, let's write the last line first that sets up the chorus. And then we'll write the penultimate line that sets up the last line. And we wrote the entire first verse backwards. That's something you can do when you have a good solid blueprint. Just like if you're building a house and you have a blueprint, you can start working on the bathroom first or on the bedroom first or on the kitchen first. If you have a blueprint and you know where everything's going to go. That's another advantage of having a blueprint is you can write a song in any order, not necessarily the order that you ultimately hear it in.
So I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope you have a sense now of how you can take your inspiration and by using the songwriter's blueprint, created a lyric that so many people can empathize with and say, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I've been there. Well, the last thing I want to do is let you know that I'm available to help you do that. Now, I do no longer do one-on-one -on -one ongoing coaching. I used to do that, but I've sort of stepped back from that now. I'm kind of retiring into the sunset, as my cat seems to agree with me. Uh, but what I do do is I do one-shot lessons. Hi, Django. I do one-shot lessons. If you're interested in just running some songs by me and getting some help on a one-shot basis, that's something I'm very happy to do. I also have this wonderful group called Song Shop that meets once a month. And basically everybody in the group says they learn as much or more from what I say about other people's songs. We all blueprint the songs that we bring in and we talk about them. We also talk about the melody and the structure and the groove and the marketing and everything. It's a great group. Uh, it's by invitation, but come and talk to me about it. And so if you want to reach me, if you want to read about anything I offer, there's my website right up there. It's jijomusic.com, J-A-I-J-O-M-U-S-I-C.com. You can, there's a whole page on Song Shop, a page on one-on-ones, a uh, page on some down, audio downloads that I have and video downloads, more opportunities if you want to work with me more. And if you want to talk to me personally, send me an email. My email is very simple. It's jai at jijomusic.com. So I hope that what I've shown you today will be helpful for you in structuring songs that can make people go, ah, yeah, I get it. So your songs are clear and have a wonderful structure and still filled with inspiration because that's really what it's all about. It's the perfect combination of the muse and the editor. That's what I want for all of you. In fact, I hope you all get placements and more. And I hope this structure that I've talked about, the Songwriter's Blueprint, is helpful for helping you go in that direction. So thank you. And as I say, and it's my, my favorite thing to say, the first word begins with a W, is right on. Adios.